Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. It's lovely to be back with you this month. We've got some very exciting news to share with you. We have won the Silver Award for Most Original Podcast in the British Podcast Awards and we are thrilled. Yeah, absolutely chuffed. It was a complete surprise. I, I wasn't expecting us to get anywhere near that. I mean, it was just brilliant to be nominated and um, to come away with the silver was just just really fantastic, actually. It, it seems incredible to me as well that, you know, we didn't set out originally to create a podcast. Mm. We had this thing we were doing of going around and talking to people about a poem that's been a friend to them. And then other people said, well, these conversations must be really amazing. We were saying, yes, they are. And then what happened was a beautiful thing of the form of podcasts being kind of there for us at the time that we had something that, that it seemed was perfectly made for that platform, if you like. Yeah, it felt like the podcast was the perfect way to share those conversations with other people, didn't it? So to win an award for a podcast, which has been a kind of, in some ways, a lucky accident for us. Yeah, it's just another beautiful surprise in the journey of the Poetry Exchange. The Accidental Podcast. I might start a new one called that. It's a good name for a podcast. It is a good name for a podcast. And it was just lovely to be at that event, meet other podcasters, feel a part of that community of podcasters. And it was a really brilliantly run event. And just a lot of fun. So just really to say a huge thanks to all of you that listen. Um, we wouldn't bother making it if it weren't for the fact that people seem to be enjoying uh, what we do. So thank you very much indeed. So it's great to be here with this month's episode. Some of you may have heard a previous episode we did with Patterson Joseph, a fantastic actor. He brought in a poem called 5am by Roxy Dunn. And this month, Roxy has come in as a guest and she has brought in another poem that's been a friend to her. We met Roxy in Pushkin House in Bloomsbury. It was a great setting for conversations about poetry and poems as friends, surrounded as we were by poets of the past and present, great Russian poets of the past and present. And the library there is really a treat and many explorations to make. So if you are in London, do go and explore Pushkin House. So you'll be listening to myself and Fiona talking about How the World Gets Bigger by Alison Hallett, the poem that's been a friend to Roxy. Have you brought a poem with you? Oh, yes, I've brought, brought a poem. Have you? Mm. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. Mm. Thanks. It's funny, I was just observing my sort of how I was feeling then, because <laughs> when I give my own poems to people to read and you have to sit there and watch them read them, obviously there's quite a lot of nerves and adrenaline, and I was thinking, why am I feeling that? Because this isn't my poem. But mm. I think there's a slight thing of, you know, will my choice be approved? It, you, know, you feel that you're still presenting. It's not your work, but it's, it's yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Never had that before. Mm. Anyway. Well, um, you're introducing your friend to someone. And let's face it, well, that right. can be a very... Yeah. It's a reflection of you. That's what it is. Yes, because yeah. when you introduce your friends to people, yeah. it's a reflection. Of, yeah, that would completely I make love sense. them, but what will they... Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Would you read it out for us? Yeah. How the world gets bigger. This morning there's a note pinned to your door explaining why you've had to rush out and cancel our meeting. I turn back into the rain, watching it falling on tarmac, rivering in gutters, little bullets exploding. I unbutton my jacket, lift my face to the sky. This is better than crying, nowhere to be and nothing to do. I walk the christened pavement, cherry tree hung like a chandelier, the corner at the end of the road suddenly appealing, the way it turns without revealing what lies beyond. And that was by Alison Hallett. Mm. Thank you. Who I don't know. Beautiful. You don't know her? No, I don't. It's really weird with this poem. So when, when, you, know, when you invited me on, I immediately was thinking, oh, OK, yeah, OK, great. Well, who will I pick? You know, there's so many poets. And I was racking my brains. And, and then I was moving and I was taking everything down from my walls and there's one poem that's been on my wall for six years and it's this one and I know nothing about the poet. It's never even occurred to me to Google her and look at her other work. It's really weird. I don't know why I've never done that. And I, I know exactly where this came from. It was, well, I don't know exactly. My mum, when I first moved to London, 
sent me, a, I assume a card, but also this little fold out leaflet with lots of different poems in, I don't know, maybe about six, and this was one of them, and it's just something I've come back to loads of times. And, and part of me thought, oh no, I'm not sure, it's, not, it's definitely not my favourite poem, but it, when it, about, in terms of being a friend, I thought, no, this, this is absolutely the one that's provided the most sort of comfort, you know, and yeah, that I've looked to. It's, yeah. fun, it's, it's funny sometimes with things that are on a wall for a long time. Did you say six years? Yeah, six years, yeah. You almost stop seeing them yeah. on some level. And on another level, I think <laughs> they kind of seep in, don't they, you know, over time. They sort of absorb what's in around them Yeah. as well, I think. I think it's interesting because I think some stuff that you, you might find in six years, you, you look at it and say, oh, right, you know, that's no longer a reflection of me and I won't, I, I, that doesn't relate to me anymore. But actually with this poem, I mean, I, I probably won't put it up on the wall in the new place, but it, it still is, I think it's always going to be relevant, actually, in the way that what it says to me. Because I don't think it's incredibly complex, and I mean this in a really positive, flattering way. It's sort of the poetry that I like to read and, um, and, and write, I suppose. I, I, it, it seems to me at quite face value just to say, well, I find it comforting. It seems to be someone that's faced rejection in some way, whether it's emotionally or through, you know, it could be a career meeting potentially. And, um, but there's so much hope at the end. It's, it's the, the end of, the, sorry, it's the, the line, the corner at the end of the road suddenly appealing the way it turns without revealing what lies beyond. And I just think it's about picking yourself up again and just turning the next corner. And, and I suppose that's sort of another reason why I was slightly reluctant initially. I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to bring this one because it feels almost too motivationally good or something. <laughs> or I don't know, you know, something you write, read on a blog. But actually, I think she, I think she gets the line really well. It's, I don't mm -hmm. think it is into the line of sort of kitsch or anything. I think she definitely, it, she's uh, emotive and relatable. But I, I think also it's, um, she's not trying to eke out loads of, you know, it's, it's not corny, that's, I think that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. No, and it's that brilliant thing that she's doing of, it's what she leaves out, you know, it's what she doesn't go into yeah. that makes it, that sort of saves it from that. It's kind of the sparseness of it. Mm. And also these sort of fabulously slightly, I mean, it's brilliant, the fact that it's an office door, isn't it? Oh, it doesn't say office. No, so but I, for some again, reason, oh, our meeting. That's what's so interesting. Our meeting makes it, made makes it me think work. it was work. Oh, so that's really interesting. You both thought work. Mm. Mm. See, I've always seen it as um, uh, a lover or a partner or like a date or something. <sighs> but, but, but then I've also thought it could be work. It's kind of been a good... It's been a really good symbol for all my rejection I've faced <laughs> <laughs> in all aspects of my life. <laughs> yeah, it's... I don't know. I, it's so weird. I have seen... Yeah, the fact that it's an office door doesn't mean that it isn't a personal meeting, of course, but somehow... I think it's great that it's ambiguous, because mm. I think you can pile what you, mm. what you want on it. Absolutely. I mean, I sent it to a friend who'd broken up with her boyfriend. I, I sort of do this, I, mean, I don't know what to say, I find yeah. poems to try and say yeah. it for me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was on the wall and I just like, you know, screenshotted it and sent it to her. I was like, I hope you feel better. Thinking Because to me, it comes back to that thing mm. of it's, there's, however bad it's feeling in this moment, there, there's hope and then, you know, turn the corner and it's, there's promise. It, well, actually the title, How the World Gets Bigger, I think it's saying if this thing closes, another opens. Mm. I just really uh, identified with this bit. Um, I unbutton my jacket, lift my face to the sky. This is better than crying. Yeah. Nowhere to be and nothing to do. That, that moment of nowhere to be and nothing to do, I love. Yeah. You go, oh, the freedom in that moment. Actually, that's really interesting because I've never thought of it in terms of this person has actually just gained potentially half an hour of their life or an hour of, of time that they just, what something was planned and so there really isn't anything else to do, it's free. Yeah, that's another, <laughs> another positive spin on the poem actually, I never thought of that, yeah. Because yeah, I've always loved that line, um, this is better than crying. I, I, I just think that's, that's really the rain, you know, just pouring down. It's like the rain's crying for you, it's, it's tears are bigger than, uh, than, than yours, yeah. It's funny, when I just sort of read it out then, I kind of had a moment of going, oh, I've read that wrong. The poet's actually saying, it's, well, it's ambiguous, I guess. This is preferable to crying, mm -hmm. 
or crying is a good thing and this is even better than crying. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Which of those is it for you? I think maybe I've seen it as both. I think I've maybe seen it as mm. initially it's a survival thing, it's a necessity, and then it becomes, oh, this is actually preferable now. In yeah. a way that almost the meeting that's been cancelled turns into a good thing because it leads to, well, as you pointed out, more time. Yeah. And also, secondly, this, this, well, this road with, which is going to lead to somewhere else now. The christened pavement. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Mm. Birth. Life. I mean, you know, it's all there for me now. Yeah, because she's interesting, because she doesn't use loads of metaphor or simile, but when she does, it does work really well. Mm. Like the cherry tree hung like a chandelier. Yeah. But presumably also jewelled with rain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Chandelier-like. Yes. See, rain, even rain. You know, I mean, it's like... Feels like it's like she starts seeing again or something. Mm. But I think rain has that really cathartic, you know, um, mm. oh god, like well, feeling to it because it, it does. It gets rid of stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. And and it, I don't know. I yeah, it's the same with. I think after crying, there's this big emotional release. I think when when it pours like that and you allow yourself to get wet, I think you feel that as well. There is something very celebratory about that second half, isn't there? And I just. So for you, like, what is your process for kind of dealing with rejection or what are some of the things that you well, I think have to deal with even? You yeah. Know, how does it kind of play out? I think amazingly it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Is this eleven lines? I think amazingly she actually goes through the process of rejection a bit in these eleven lines mm. because one thing I and I was told this really early on at drama school, one of the directors said you have to take the night and, you know, take a night and mourn for the job that you didn't get. You know, you've got to go get out the whiskey. You've got to go, I really wanted that job. And it's the same with breakup. I think you do have to let yourself go go to that place. But then it's, it's the shift, isn't it? So the, if, if you call the first half the kind of breakdown bit, the second bit is the is the rebuilding. And I think it's that process. But I don't think, you, I, I suppose I'm... Um, I'm, I'm quite open to, 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 to feeling sad in order to then feel happy again. I'm not somebody that's terrified of sadness. Mm. I'm really not, actually, mm. yeah. Mm. And I think that's always been important, accepting it before I can, and, and, and actually dealing with that bit before I can move on and be happier and, posit and more positive again. So what immediately came into my mind then when you said I'm not terrified of sadness um, was I just wondered if your mum has noticed that you pinned this to your wall? Ah, um, oh no, probably, I don't know if she's ever been in my room in London. But she gave you this leaflet that had she, these I mean, it was literally on. a leaflet. I just don't know where she got it from. Okay. And does she do that sort of, is she prone to poem gift making or? No, no, she's not Extract actually. gift making. She would, tell you what she's really done all my life, she's cut out bits of newspaper articles yeah. and she used to stick them in the toilet and so we'd always have to be learning, Fabulous. you know, while we were on the loo. Yeah. Um, and it'd be like break. this week's food scare or something, you know, we're not eating this anymore or, you know, like some, oh, I don't know, some, yeah, but it's normally, it was just literally snippets of the newspaper put stuck up in the, in the toilet. Really, so if there was something that she'd read and she wanted the rest the of the family <laughs> to be aware of it, she'd cut it out and yeah. sort of blue tack it on the Well, just think she thought we're interested that we, that we should... Maybe just got some for dinner. That's I, don't know. I love it. It's yeah. brilliant. I love that. Yeah, and it was quite a quirky house. It was a lot growing up that I considered normal that I've later realised absolutely just wasn't normal. Mm. Can mm. I have another example, please? Actually, <laughs> I knew you were going to then ask for one of those. Um, I will think of some. Say the one stuff. that you don't want to say that's in your head right now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just thinking we've got, but it's not that weird, but we've got like a samurai, like a, a samurai on the stairs that's just odd. It's not a particularly old house, but then there's this samurai suit that was in the loft. I don't know where it came from, but it's on a clothes stand. But then classically in our house, something's weird stuff have been added to it. So it's now got like a, a sword, but that's actually for a barbecue. And it had a pig mask as a face last time I went home. I mean, I don't really get involved anymore. You know, I don't live there. It's not. It's really like a mine. kind of life-size samurai suit. You're sort of yeah, like a like a samurai. A genuine article. Yeah, I think maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but it's just been Sam. All that's all how I've known him. Just as Sam. Sam. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Did your mum sort of introduce you to poetry? 
That is a really good question. I don't think specifically I think I've grown up in a, in a house which yeah I mean they're both literary they, there's lots of books around um, my dad does write I mean he is a poet he writes as well um, uh, but, but I don't know I wonder and again like obviously I learned it at school but I don't know what it is that makes you sort of that made me really just love it because I remember when we were at school we were about 14 and we were reading these poems and they were about sort of like it's Gillian Gillian Clark Gillian so it's about Clark, being a mother yeah. I was 14, just going, oh my god, this poem is amazing. And my friends were like, what are you talking about? Like, this is, what did you even get from this? This is so weird. I like, talk about the umbilical cord and stuff. And I don't know. I, I don't know why poetry does this to me. And not all poems either. I mean, I'm quite immediate. I, I sort of, I get a visceral hit or, and I, or, or I don't. And actually, if I don't, I'm quite sort of brutal. I probably should spend longer with stuff. But actually, if I don't get that, that kick, then I tend to go, nah, and move on. But then sometimes when I come back to that poem, you know, years later, I'm trying to think of an example because I've done that before and I've gone, yeah. oh, God, I really like that now. I can really... Yeah. Isn't that weird? Do you read it aloud at all? So when you read it aloud and yeah, hear... I do that with things I like. When I'm reading mm. poems, um, then I come across them, I read them aloud in my room if I like them. Same with bits of books as well, actually, like mm. segments of novels. For yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask, how does it sort of um, fit or mm. sit in your life, your mm. poetry writing? Because you obviously act and you write plays and uh, I don't know where it sort of, how you compartmentalise it for yourself yeah. or in a way if it's all one and it's just what you happen to be doing at any given yeah. time. I think that's a really, that question's actually come at a really good time because of where I'm at with poems. So. What happened was, up until I would say I brought out clowning, I, poetry had always only ever been a hobby, and it was very much a thing I and I and the, the thing I loved about it was it was different to my other writing when I was writing the TV stuff or the or the plays because it was there was zero pressure on it, and it was really if I felt a burst of inspiration, I wrote it, and if I didn't, I I never put pressure on to to write anything. So really, my process was. You know, I'd be on a tube, I'd be walking along, I'd get an idea, I'd write down a few lines, and then, yeah, okay, I'd go back and craft it. But I didn't really, I want to say agonise, because the way that I relate to other writing, it is, it feels like agony. So it is so hard, the other stuff I find. And poetry has always been a, com I won't say a complete pleasure, but it really has not been a, a toil, if, if that makes sense. But something has slightly shifted in that something in me has gone, okay, I sort of waited, and I waited for, to feel some inspiration after after I did clowning, and I sort of just didn't, I didn't, I didn't, and it's only been very recently I'm kind of going, okay, I need to stop reject. I think what's happened is I've rejected the ideas that I've been coming up with because somehow they're not good enough anymore, or they need to be a next step up, or they need to be different. And I've had this thing. My dad, I was having coffee with my dad the other day, and he said, yeah, because I said, why you're not writing at the moment? Why aren't you writing? And he said, well, I did think of a. I don't know if it's a Brexit poem or something. And I said, yeah. And he said, I didn't write it in the end because I thought somebody else has already written it. And I thought, oh God, that's exactly what I'm having at the moment. Mm. And it's not, it's not, it's not helpful. If you want to carry on writing, it isn't the way to think. It's no. completely legitimate. But, it, but if you're going to write, it's, it, it's just going to block you so much. And I just think there were a few things going on that was, and that was one of them that was stopping me. I love this. I love this. Hey, do you guys, do you, oh, good, you like my friend? Oh, oh so yeah. Glad. <laughs> so no, I really, me. I really, really, really do, and I think it really, yeah. I mean, it's the obvious, it's the obvious big, sort of common measure to bring, but it really, really delivers on the every word counts. Yeah. Score, doesn't it? Mm. It seems to me it's that kind of friend. That you know what you know, you call them up and you know or you hope that actually they are they're gonna they're gonna cheer you up. They're gonna tell you the things you already know, but you kinda need to hear them yeah. from someone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. And actually I think one of the interesting things is if you look at friends, we they do offer I think it's quite rare that a friend gives you everything. There's quite a few friends that would, that would mm. do that. There aren't many. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that you 
I almost know if I, I you know, you, you, before you call somebody, you kind of know the response that you want. And you very much, I think, tailor your call. You're like, okay, what response do I want? Who will I call to get that response? Mm. And that's why I think this, this exercise is, is so interesting, this conversation about you pick a poem for, for a friend because, yeah, the temptation friend, we've got that friend that, that we know will go, oh, just do it, mate, it'll be funny and it'll be brilliant. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And then it's probably not the same friend who would give you this, mm, you know. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's kind of like comforting, but resilient as well, isn't it? It's sort of... It's not comforting in the way of someone saying they're there. No, 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 you're absolutely right. It's not. It's this person that says, yeah, it is shit, but then it's not going to be shit. It's kind of that one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And they help you to see things in a more positive light. Yeah. How the world gets bigger. This morning, there's a note pinned to your door explaining why you've had to rush out and cancel our meeting. I turn back into the rain, watch it falling on tarmac, rivering in gutters, little bullets exploding. I unbutton my jacket, lift my face to the sky. This is better than crying. Nowhere to be and nothing to do. I walk the christened pavement, cherry tree hung like a chandelier, the corner at the end of the road suddenly appealing, the way it turns without revealing what lies beyond. That was Fiona with the reading of How the World Gets Bigger by Alison Hallett. Thank you so much to Alison Hallett for giving us permission to feature the poem in this episode. And you can find the text of the poem on the description page, as well as details of Alison's work and her website. And I really recommend you going there and having a look at all the amazing work she's doing. The website's called The Stone Library. And our thanks also to Roxy Dunn for coming in and talking to us and giving us permission to use the conversation. We had a wonderful time that day in Pushkin Library, especially meeting Roxy, and we hope you've had a wonderful time listening to this month's episode. And as we mentioned earlier, Roxy had sort of already appeared by virtue of her poem, 5am, on a previous episode. So if you haven't yet listened to that one, do head for that episode with Patterson Joseph speaking about 5am. Poetry Exchange has been out and about recently. We've been in Manchester. Yes. And uh, also recently in Stoke. Yes, in Stoke-on-Trent. So we hope to be bringing you an episode from one of those places maybe next month. If you'd like to leave us a review or a rating with iTunes, that would be really fantastic. And uh, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and all the usual places if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you for listening.